History tells the story of the world and of our lives. Sometimes that history goes bump in the night. Broadcasting from the center of oddity and the supernatural in Central Florida, it's the History Goes Bump podcast. Hello, you spectacular people. Welcome to this 410th episode of the History Ghost Bump podcast, Ghost Tours for the Theater of the Mind. I am your host, Diane. And this is Kelly. <music> Kelly, put on your boots and grab a horse. We're going to a ghost town. Yeehaw! <laughs> This is the ghost town of Sarah Gordo, and this was suggested by our listener, Julie Shandemar, I think is how you say her last name. Hopefully we said that right. Before we get into that, we want to welcome into the Spooktacular crew, Katie, with an I-E at the end of her name, Laura, Samantha, Leland, with two E's, Allie, with just a Y, and Alyssa. Thank you so much for joining us in the Spooktacular crew. And now, this moment, Noddity. The Arabia Steamboat Museum is found in Kansas and remembers the Steamboat Arabia tragedy. The Steamboat Arabia was built in Pennsylvania in 1853. The ship spent its time transporting passengers along the Missouri River, and she also carried cargo like merchandise for stores and the mail. The Arabia didn't work very long as she sank on September 5, 1856. The Missouri River was a treacherous river, and one of the biggest dangers were fallen trees that were hard to see because they would lie just under the surface of the water. On that fateful day, the Arabia hit one of those trees and sank in a matter of minutes. The 150 passengers and crew on board managed to make it out to safety, so no one died. Over time, the Missouri River shifted. That didn't reveal the Arabia, though, as it had sunk 45 feet underground. A group of four men led an effort in 1988 to excavate the steamboat, and they found a large collection of pre-Civil War artifacts and glass bottles that still held their contents. Some of those contents were preserved pie fruit and pickles. One of the excavators ate some of the preserved pickles and found them not only to be edible, but still fresh. And that certainly is odd. This history podcast is haunted. And now, this month in history. In the month of November, on the 1st in 1512, the Sistine Chapel ceiling opens to the public. The Sistine Chapel is the chief consecrated space in the Vatican, and someone very talented was needed to paint frescoes on the ceiling. Michelangelo, the greatest Italian Renaissance artist in human history, got the call from Rome in 1508. He had started his life in art at the age of 13, working as an artist's apprentice. His talent was soon discovered and nurtured. Michelangelo crafted such works as the Pieta and David before he was called to paint the ceiling of the chapel. The frescoes he created were epic and featured nine panels of biblical history, starting with the creation of the world. Other panels feature the creation of Adam, with God and Adam stretching their arms out towards each other, the expulsion of Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden, and Noah and the Flood. Figures from the Old Testament can be found along the sides of the panels, and Michelangelo used fictive architectural molding and supporting statues to pull everything together. The work took four years to complete and is a masterpiece. The ghost town of Cerro Gordo is found in California's Inyo Mountains. This fairly prosperous mining town was established in the mid-1800s and had been mostly abandoned for decades. 
New life was breathed into it recently after being purchased in 2018 for almost $1.5 million. This mining camp had been a dangerous place to live. People died from gunfights, disease, and mining accidents. And now it would seem that spirits still remain because of all those deaths. Join us as we explore the history and hauntings of the Cerro Gordo ghost town. Gordo was founded in 1865. The name in Spanish means Fat Hill. Really, I mean, should you be judging hills in that way? Very disrespectful. And the peak sits eight miles east and 5,000 feet above Owens Lake, which had actually been a lake at one time but is dried up now. Pablo Flores is credited with discovering silver ore here, and he began mining and smelting operations. Growth for the mining town was slow, as Native American populations kept people from coming. Fort Independence was built nearby, and the soldiers here expelled the Native American populations. Everything was very primitive with this early operation. The ore was smelted in adobe ovens. Another miner named Jose Ochoa was pulling as much as 1.5 tons of ore out of the San Lucas mine every 12 hours. Can you imagine? That's just by hand, personally. As word about the silver ore got out, more miners came. The quality of the ore caught the attention of a Quebec-born settler at Fort Independence named Victor Beaudry. And just in case people don't know what a settler is, because we didn't, this was a person who followed an army and sold provisions to the soldiers. So it was a pretty clever little idea. Run around and say, hey, you need a pack of cigs or some snacks. Definitely. He was a businessman, and he decided to open a general store in the town. Beaudry was a smart man, and he would trade provisions with the miners in exchange for portable silver and lead that the miners had smelted together. Beaudry also extended credit to the miners, and this enabled him to eventually foreclose on their claims, and he soon owned most of the Cerro Gordo mines. This included a half-interest in the largest, the Union, perched above the camp. Beaudry built two modern smelters in the town with his money as well. The road in and out of the town became treacherous, with bandits waiting to grab ore from miners heading down into other towns. Tiburcio Vasquez was a highwayman who worked in California from 1854 to 1874, and of course we use the word worked loosely. (laughs) And the Vasquez Rocks north of Los Angeles was a frequent hideout for him, and so they named this for him. He was a real ladies' man and considered handsome and a great dancer. His trademark was to bind the hands of his victims and leave them face down in the dirt. Vasquez was captured in 1874, tried, and sentenced to hang. This execution took place on March 19, 1875. He had a lieutenant named Cleovaro Chavez, and they would stop people to ask for, quote-unquote, tolls. This became a lucrative business with dozens of Teamster teams taking the route to Los Angeles with ore, and then back to Cerro Gordo with liquor and sundries. The Teamsters would try to warn each other if they ran into bandits, and some would stash the ore along the road to come back for later. Vasquez and his crew left the area after stopping a stagecoach near Cerro Gordo and shooting and wounding a man. So I'm getting a feeling for the kind of thing that he did here is that he usually wasn't injuring anybody in a major way. You know, they just kind of leave him tied up and dumped somewhere. So I'm thinking because they ended up shooting and wounding somebody, they're like, we better get out of town. In April 1868, mining engineer Mortimer Belshaw arrived from San Francisco with plans to build a smelter. He bought a one-third interest in the mountain's largest Galena load, which is silver-bearing lead ore. Many of the mines, including the large Union mine, were tapped into this vein of silver ore. He and his business partner, Abner B. Elder, built the yellow-grade road that led up to the mines. He also built the Belshaw House, a two-bedroom, one-bath house that still stands in the mining camp and has served a variety of purposes from a private residence to a bed and cook-your-own breakfast that sleeps up to five. Bell Shaw and Elder found a third partner, president of the California paper company Egbert Judson, and they formed the Union Mining Company. 
the group went forward with building a steam-powered smelter and ran the thing 24-7. The smelter produced 120 silver and lead ingots a day, each weighing 85 pounds. Now, speaking of this yellow grade road, that's still kind of the road that leads up to the mines and even getting into the ghost town. We were watching Ghost Adventures. Did you watch the part where they were driving up there in their Jeeps? Yes, I did. That road was just about wide enough to get the Jeeps on it. And it had like a steep drop off on the sides. I was like, there is no way I think I could ever go to visit this ghost town because I could never do that drive. I would just be freaking out the whole time because of my fear of heights and stuff. Follow the yellow brick road. Follow, 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 follow the yellow brick road. No. Oh. Well, I guess. I mean, maybe if it had yellow bricks, I'd be a little bit more comfortable with it. If it had little uh, munchkins around it, I would probably be a little afraid if the person who's driving is also seeing the munchkins, because it probably means we partook in something that you shouldn't before you go driving on a treacherous maybe road. Maybe some peyote or something? Yeah, something. <laughs> At this point, Baudry and Belshaw were in competition. But they realized if they worked together, they could control the whole town. Isn't that fabulous? Don't you love it when you have two powerful people decide that, hey, we've got all the money. Let's go ahead and run the town together. Mm-hmm. They produced so much ore that it couldn't be hauled down the mountain fast enough. Remy Nadeau was a French-Canadian freighter. They hired to haul the ore to Los Angeles in a trek that took three weeks. God, can you imagine it taking that long to get the ore into Los Angeles from Cerro Gordo? No, but I'm familiar with the Inyo Mountains, so mm -hmm. it's a bit of a trek. Is it okay? The ore would be separated at the refinery in Los Angeles. As the town grew into a boom town, trouble came with it, and law enforcement tended to stay away from the town, which had about 5,000 residents at its height. There was at least one murder every week, and shootouts were a normal occurrence. The danger was so bad that miners would stack sandbags in their beds in order to take the impact of stray bullets that might be flying when they were sleeping. Can you imagine? No. <laughs> it's like, I'm not setting up these pillows around me because I want to be more comfortable. Creating a berm of safety. <laughs> I mean, sandbags. I can't even imagine. There's just so many bullets flying. You're like, I might get shot to death in my sleep, so... A horrible mining accident happened in the 1870s when a mine collapsed and trapped around 30 Chinese miners. They were never rescued and are still buried underground. A man named James Brady took over the shipping contract in 1871, and he had a new method. He had established the town of Swansea on the east side of Owens Lake and launched an 85-foot steamer he named Bessie Brady after his daughter. This saved at least two days in transport, so more money was being made at least for a little while. Rain is not a usual thing in California, but at this time, torrential rains fell and Brady fell behind. Then Brady and Belshaw got into a fight over mining rights that ended up in court. Brady won, but he lost the shipping contract. Nadeau took over the freight again in 1873, but he wanted in on the action this time. So he was made a full partner in a freighting company they called Cerro Gordo Freighting Company. Wow, that's so original. <laughs> It was also decided to build stations along the route to make the trip easier. What a great idea. Here, we can get some water here, some food. Belshaw and Beaudry were considered bullion kings at the height of the mine's output. In total, the mines produced 17 million in silver and lead ore. That equates to 400 million in today's dollars. Wow, that's a lot of money. Cha-ching! Those were some rich guys there. The mining industry helped to build Los Angeles. It's sad to think that this town became a mostly forgotten ghost town after spending nearly $350,000 on local farmers' feed crops like barley and hay. The town was diverse, with a large mix of Hispanics, Chinese, whites, and Native Americans, most of whom worked the mines for $4 a day and had a life expectancy of five years. Five years of working in the mines, <laughs> not five-year-olds. <laughs> yes, well, yeah, I would assume. <laughs> John Simpson and his wife had built the American Hotel in 1871. There were two dance hall brothels, blacksmiths, assay offices, a couple of general stores, saloons, restaurants, and bunkhouses. Interestingly, though, there were no schools, churches, or a jail. Yes, I find that fascinating. We were a pretty... Uh... Missing a few details. Yeah, I think they were a crazy <laughs> town with a lot of violence and gambling and you got your brothels and everything. Who wants to put a church in the middle of that? And of course, not having a jail there kind of makes you think, 
Well, the reason they didn't have a jail there is because law enforcement kind of stayed away from the place, too. They're like, nah, you guys have at it. Protect yourselves. And, of course, no school, I am assuming, because they didn't probably have a whole lot of children in town. Probably not. Commerce slowed down in 1877 when the Union burned down. It was rebuilt but left Belshaw in debt, and he shut down his furnace and cut the pay to $3 a day. Many miners left, and the Union closed down in 1879. Beaudry shut down his furnace after that and sent the last shipment of ore in November of 1879. Beaudry died in 1888, and Belshaw died in 1898. The best story is Nadeau's. He was smart and invested his money in wine grapes, barley, and sugar beets. He bought land in downtown Los Angeles and built the Nadeau Hotel in 1886. This hotel was demolished in 1932 and a new building was built that is the Los Angeles Times building that is part of Times Mirror Square today. An interesting story connected to this location from Haunted Places, which was written by Dennis William Huck, goes this way. Because you know me, Kelly, I always have to look up and see if all these other locations have some kind of ghosts, too. Absolutely. Timesmere Square. In 1934, mining engineer W. Warren Schufelt proposed excavating this area of Los Angeles in hopes of discovering traces of a lost civilization. According to Hopi Indian legends, the lizard people used some sort of rock-dissolving chemical to build a subterranean city here in 3000 B.C. Schufelt sunk a 350-foot shaft on North Hill Street and allegedly bored into secret gold-filled catacombs. Using radio waves, Schufelt produced detailed maps of the underground city and located the central treasure room 400 feet below Timesmere Square. Although few people took him seriously at the time, construction workers have since unearthed miles of tunnels, which historians attribute to 19th century smugglers. So, no gold was ever found, but pretty cool that they found the tunnels, and I just thought that was a fascinating story. According to the Hopi Indian, so very cool. And just as a fun little side note, the Times Mirror Square is bounded by First Street and Broadway in downtown Los Angeles. According to Schufelt, the Lizard People's underground city runs under the financial district from Central Library to what is now Dodger Stadium. Ooh, there might be some gold under Dodger Stadium. Dodger Blues. A vast network of ventilation shafts extend from the area around the Southwest Museum all the way to the Pacific Ocean. But this wasn't the end for Cerro Gordo. Low-grade silver ore continued to be pulled from the area mines into the 20th century. High-grade zinc ore was discovered in 1907 in the Union Mine, and a different kind of smelter was built at the base of the mountain, and the ore was moved in buckets on a cable tramway. The operation was slightly successful until Louis D. Gordon bought the title and incorporated the Cerro Gordo Mines Company. Business started booming as 20 tons of zinc ore were mined daily. The ore was shipped via railway to the United States Smelting and Refining Company in Utah for processing. Silver and lead were still being pulled between 1911 and 1919. Many of the tunnels were extended, and while they aren't safe to enter now, there are 37 miles of tunnels snaking through the mountain. American smelting of Utah took over the mines from Gordon in the 1920s, and then the U.S. Army came during World War II to get zinc out of the mines for the war effort. The zinc was used to make pennies because the copper was needed for war equipment. The pennies were steel and coated with zinc to prevent rust. And I actually have three of those. Wow, wow, wow. By 1959, the mines were no longer in use. W.C. Riggs had bought the property after the war, and he hired a woman named Barbara and her boyfriend to work as caretakers. Barbara had previously worked for RKO Pictures and had been married to an assistant director. So apparently, Kelly, she ran away to a ghost town with her boyfriend. Alrighty then. <laughs> they could make a movie of that. <laughs> hey, RKO Pictures. Riggs went bankrupt and didn't pay the couple, so they took him to court and were awarded ownership of Cerro Gordo in 1949. That works out pretty good. Say, yeah, we've been taking care of them. the place. He's not paying us. Okay, we'll give it to you. Eventually, the boyfriend died and Barbara married Jack Smith. They sold the property to Jack Smith's niece, Jody Stewart, and she and her husband, Mike, began restoring the buildings and turning the ghost town into a tourist attraction. They turned the general store into a museum and reopened the American Hotel. The Bell Shaw House was turned into a bed and breakfast where the guests make their own breakfast. A bunkhouse dating to 1904 was also opened as a place for up to 12 guests to bunk. In 2001, Jody died and Mike followed in 2009, and Mike's son, Sean Patterson, inherited the property. Sean hired a caretaker to continue the restoration and give tours. On July 13, 2018, a man named Brent Underwood spent $1.4 million to purchase Cerro Gordo, along with some partners. 
there were 22 structures still standing of the 500 that were once here. These included the mining operation, Belshaw House, the American Hotel, a general store, the assayer's office, and Lola's Palace of Pleasure. <laughs> I'm sure that was a game arcade kind of place, right? Uh huh. Underwood is the current owner and actually spent part of the pandemic snowed in on the property. Yeah, he ended up going up there right before the pandemic kicked in and was going to give the caretaker a break so that he could go and have a little vacation. And then snow fell just at the same time as the pandemic hit. <laughs> Underwood has spent 2020 and 2021 exploring his ghost town and refurbishing buildings. He's rappelled 1,100 feet underground into the tunnels and posted the videos on YouTube. Many parts of the Union mine hadn't been seen in decades, and Underwood found lots of artifacts in the mines and in the town. Many of these items told the story of the miners' lives. There were love letters, mining claims, tobacco tins, old newspapers, divorce settlements, and bank documents. There was even still some dynamite down in the mine, so he has to be a little careful when he repels down there. Yikes. Things were really moving along for Underwood until tragedy struck. The historic American Hotel, the Cropo House, and the Ice House at Cerro Gordo burned down in what is thought to have been an electrical fire in an early morning fire on Monday, June 15th, 2020. In a weird coincidence, and Kelly, you know we don't really believe in coincidences around here, the American Hotel had originally opened on June 15th, 1871, so it opened and burned down on the same date. Interestingly, Underwood told the LA Times that he thought the cause of the fire could be paranormal. He said the caretaker here told me that he and another person saw a shadowy apparition moving in the hotel kitchen at 4 p.m. the previous day. So what did it do? Light up the stove or something? Could be. The Croppo house had belonged to William Croppo, who had gunned down a postmaster as he walked along the dirt road near the American Hotel. So that's how he got infamous. Fun fact, Jeff Goldblum has been by the ghost town. He was there to film an episode of his TV show, The World According to Jeff Goldblum, that featured the history of denim. Many California silver miners wore them since they were specifically invented for them by Levi Strauss in 1871. And I remember in one of the videos that Underwood did, he went down and found uh, just a few pieces of denim. It wasn't even a full pair of jeans. And I remember that, too. He was too. like, this is probably worth a lot of money now because there are people who will pay a ton of money for that old denim. Caretakers for years have told stories of having strange experiences in the ghost town. Many believe the place is haunted. Lights switch on and off in unoccupied buildings on the regular. Underwood has experienced this himself. He said, I went in, turned them off, relocked the building, and they were turned on again that night. The strange happenings seemed magnified when Underwood was snowed in and around to notice them more. Books would spontaneously fall off of shelves. When it's once or twice, probably is nothing, but having it happen on the regular seems weird. Underwood's wallet moves around. He'll find it in places he knows he didn't put it. In 2019, Zach Baggins and the crew of Ghost Adventures paid Cerro Gordo a visit and concluded paranormal activity here could be the result of two child spirits trapped in Belshaw House, an 1800 structure Underwood was living in. Roger Vargo and his wife Cecile talked with Baggins about their experiences staying in the Belshaw house. They were sleeping in the bedroom and something pounced on his wife that she couldn't see. Other people had similar experiences there. Robert Desmaris was a caretaker and he felt something jump on his chest and it knocked the wind out of him, so he knew it wasn't a dream. Another investigator captured an EVP of a child's voice and there were no kids in the town. Could these children be jumping on the people? I mean, it sounds like it to me. If you're getting pounced on hard enough to knock the wind out of you, it could be a kid just coming out of nowhere. Bam. Hey, let's <laughs> yeah, play. Could be. Or a dog. <laughs> Alphonse Benoit was shot and killed in the poker room. Zach thought he heard something coming from that room. There's a bullet hole with blood stains on the floor in there. Right near the area, Billy and Zach felt a definable cold spot. The EMF meter spiked there, a really big spike. Billy felt as though his fingers were really cold all of a sudden. Zach got out the thermal camera, and it was clear that Billy's fingers were blue while the rest of his hand was the normal human red, orange, and yellow colors. And Zach's hand right next to his was completely red. And we watched that episode, and I mean, you really can't fake something like that when you're seeing both their hands sitting right there in right. front of the FLIR camera. And it was amazing how blue Billy's fingertips were. It was like there was no blood in them. Yeah, very distinctively. Which makes you wonder, like, what was touching him almost like some kind of a ghost was interfering there 
and causing his hands to go cold just on the fingertips. It's like, what was it, just touching his fingers or what? Then they caught something bluish green in the form of a human torso manifesting on the other side of the table. And this was in the FLIR camera too. And I mean, it it looked kind of like a shape of a human torso and about the height that it would be. Aaron and Zach heard footsteps in the house when they were lying on beds, and their cameras did catch very faint footsteps. The ghost of Mr. Belshaw has been seen in the house. He appeared as a portly man, as described by eyewitnesses. Billy had set up a rig with a deep-sea fishing pole, where he sent an audio recorder and GoPro down into a very deep mine shaft. Billy felt a sharp tug at one point that he described as feeling like a fish on his line, and the camera showed the line bobbing as if tugged. Billy was really shaken by the experience, and it seemed legit. When I was watching that, I really believed that something happened with Billy because he was just sitting there. Nothing was happening for a while, and he's just lowering it down slowly. And he's being real careful because they don't want to lose their equipment. Right. And then all of a sudden, he was like, whoa, and he grabbed the fishing pole quick because I don't think he was holding it real tight. And he described it as if he goes, I've been fishing. And he goes, it felt like a fish getting on the line and pulling it. It's crazy. They also caught two long and interesting EVP on the recorder while in the shaft. And this happened at the same time that he got the tugging. Right. One said, can anybody hear me? And the other, I'm going to work. Aaron and Zach were investigating in the poker room and caught an EVP that they said sounded like, you both just walked to me. But I thought it sounded more like, do you want to F with me? Which I thought sounds a little bit more accurate if you think that there was a shootout in this poker game kind of thing. They put an ovelus near the bullet hole and the word slain came up. A game camera seemed to pick up a figure that is not solid because the guys showed what they looked like crossing in front of the game camera. As it was one of the final things that was in that episode, does kind of look like a figure kind of off in the distance, not real close, that kind of crosses into the camera and then moves away from it. I thought it totally looked like an apparition because when they showed themselves crossing later... It was very clearly them. Yeah, it went from something that was kind of a weird looking figure, can't quite make it out to clear as day as if you were watching people on your ring camera right? And walking past have, your house. And it wouldn't have been a, an animal or anything like that. Either. No, no. And it was just weird because all of a sudden it was like in it and then back out the side. Whereas I would think an animal would just continue on the path that it was on. Ghost towns are notoriously haunted because they were usually notorious places. That would be the case for Cerro Gordo. There are many reasons for this town to be haunted. Is the Cerro Gordo ghost town haunted? That That is is for you to decide. decide. Well, Kelly, another place there in California that you haven't been to, although you've been up near the mountains, right? I've been near this area, yes, with my parents when I was younger. But just never visited the ghost town i don't believe so i was kind of young i would probably need to ask my parents because we would go on vacation sightsee all around that whole area it sounds like a place that you kind of specifically have to set up to go out there it's not like some of these other ghost towns that are made to be these real tourist attractions this is more of a you want to go out there and camp overnight kind of thing and We'd love to have you guys check out our website at historyghostbump.com. And if you want to send us some feedback, you can do that at historyghostbump at gmail.com. We got an email from Susan. She says, hi, Diane and Kelly. It's October 31st, and I'm listening to the Halloween special. Great episode. The story of the young couple with a disabled car, followed by your angel experience, Diane, brought up a similar memory. When I was in my early 30s, I was taking evening classes at the local community college. To get to my class, I had to cross a large open brick courtyard, which was completely deserted as I was running late. Footsteps echoed in the empty courtyard, especially at night. I'll just say that now. Out of nowhere, a very handsome young man, he was a stunner if I'm honest, approached me and said he'd like to see me safely to my building. He kept a distance, and I felt no sense of discomfort at all. As I turned to thank him, he was simply gone. This is an enormous courtyard, and there had been no footsteps before after this encounter. I was shaken, but as I was about to be late for my class, I tried to brush it aside. When I got to my classroom, the instructor was making an announcement that two young women had been attacked in the past few days, and the college was urging female students not to walk alone anywhere until this was resolved. Talk about a thunderbolt. I believe then, and I believe now, that this was an angel. It not only explained the sudden silent appearance and disappearance, it also explained my absolute calm and lack of wariness. It's still comforting after 30 years. Wow, that is so cool. Yeah, I have no doubt that maybe that was 
her guardian angel or some kind of guardian angel of some sort saying, let me make sure you get to class okay, because we've had some trouble in this courtyard. And then Jules wanted to share with us that they are doing a Dickens Christmas in Tuscumbia, Alabama. I hope I said that right. There will be several events taking place in Tuscumbia's oldest and most haunted buildings. She's going to be singing Christmas poetry in an original 1820s church used by the Union Army and their horses. She'll also be performing with her friends at Belmont as well. Locust Hill House, which is very haunted and hosts monthly investigations, also will be hosting events as well. It will be taking place on December 11th. And she said she'd love for us to come and join them. Very cool. I don't know if we'll be able to make the trip, but it sounds like an excellent experience. Yeah, I uh, I did look it up. It's an over a 10 hour drive. So <laughs> probably not going to happen, but sounds fabulous. She did try to tempt us. And if any of you are in the area, if that's not enough to get you to go, she says there's a steakhouse nearby that, that literally marinates their steaks in pure melted butter and lemon juice. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, maybe, maybe we can make the drive. So good. <laughs> we want to thank you guys for tuning in to this episode. I've been your host, Diane. And this has been Kelly. You take care now. Bye-bye. This episode isn't brought to you by our executive producers. Dispatches from the Grave Digger. We want to thank Sarah Silver for raising your donation. We're going to be moving you into a chest tomb. And welcome into the cemetery, Laura Forsyth. We're going to be burying you under an obelisk tombstone. Thank you so much for supporting History Goes Bump. You can find History Goes Bump on Spotify, iHeartRadio, Stitcher. Apple Podcasts, Pandora, Google Play, and anywhere you can listen to podcasts. Missouri River was a treacherous was a treacherous river. I can't say treacherous and river together. <laughs> <laughs> it was a really bad river. Join us as we explain explain. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to explain some history and haunting. <laughs> and he began mining and smelting operations. Whoever smelt it dealt it. Oh, that's great, <laughs> Kelly. <I'm laughs> The Teamsters would try to warn each other if they ran into bandits, and some would slash the oar. Slash the oar, not stash it. How you feeling, babe? <laughs> I'm a little tired. I just got done running a 10K. You did? <laughs> you did a great job. I'm so proud of you. Hey, and when it's got Oogie Boogie and Jack Skellington hosting the thing, I had to do it. Absolutely. It's the coolest medal I think I've ever earned. <laughs> I love it. We got to figure out how to attach some magnets. Yeah, we're going to put, put some on magnets fridge. on the back so it can go on the fridge. Remy Nadeau was a French Canadian freighter. Eh, they. <laughs> <laughs> My tape got stuck. <laughs> rewind, rewind. <laughs> the ore was shipped via railway. Railway. I always have a hard time saying that too. <laughs> And I noticed on the last bonus cast I did, you know, I, I always say I have a hard time saying soldiers. I always end up saying shoulders. Yeah. And I did it in the bonus cast and I didn't even catch it did when you I was really? editing. I didn't it. notice it either. I'm like, those shoulders went forward Soldier. to fight. Shoulders. <laughs> Fun fact, Jeff Goldblum. Fun. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, wow, then. <laughs> Wowsy wowzers. <laughs> One said, can anybody hear me? Yes, we can. Kiwi, we right. can hear you. <laughs> it's not funny. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he just starts chirping away. Aaron and Zach were investigating in the poker room and caught an EVP that they said sounded like... Nope, didn't sound like that, Kiwi. <laughs>